Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Virtual College Coach Panel brought to you by the American Volleyball Coaches Association and our affiliate partner, the Great Plains Region. My name is Joya Pollard. I am the Membership and Communication Specialist for the ABCA. Uh, before we get started, I would like to explain our partnership briefly with our USAV regions. These regions are all proud members of the ABCA Region Affiliate Partner Program, or RAP. The RAP program is designed to link college and youth volleyball by providing regions with information on colleges in their area, familiarizing them with various recruiting rules, providing opportunities for engagement and recognition, and sharing educational materials. Today's panel will be recorded, so registrants will be able to receive this recording within 72 hours. And we will get started by introducing each coach by their division and then open up for questions. If you do have a question, please feel free to type them into the questions box and we will get to them during the panel. So let's go ahead and get started. And uh, Linda, if you wanna kick it off for us. Uh, Richard, why don't you go ahead and introduce, um, kick us off uh, while we're waiting on Linda. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, I'm Rick Squires. I'm the head volleyball coach at the University of Nebraska Kearney. We are Division II NCAA school um, in Kearney, Nebraska, and uh, participate in the Central Region in Division II. Justin? Hey, my name is Justin D. I'm the head volleyball coach at uh, Bellhaven University. We're actually located in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, I'm also the uh, high performance director for the Delta region of USA Volleyball as well. Um, so uh, we are in division three and participate in the American Southwest Conference, uh, which is located mostly out of uh, Texas. We have some in Arkansas as well and uh, some in Louisiana and in Mississippi as well. Erin? Uh, yes, hi, I'm Erin Luthi and I'm the head women's volleyball coach at Taylor University. We are located in North Central Indiana. Uh, we are part of the Crossroads League and we are an NAIA uh, collegiate program. Paula? Hi, I'm Paula Wiedemann. I'm the head volleyball coach at Missouri State University, West Plains. Uh, we are a two-year college located in West Plains, Missouri. Um, our Campus is part of a system with Missouri State in Springfield, the four-year campus. Um, and we are part of the NJCAA. There are actually three different divisions of two-year colleges. The NJCAA, which covers primarily most of the United States. And then you have the California, the 3C2A, and also the NWAC, which is primarily Oregon, Washington, and a few Idaho schools. Um, there are 24 regions within the NJCAA, and um, like I said, it's pretty much spread across the country. We're going to go ahead and start kicking it off with questions. Um, 
Rick, I'll go ahead and kick it off to you first. Uh, this one is uh, pretty specific for everyone. It's briefly um, describing your division and if there's any specific academic criteria for your division. Well, our division is, uh, it's like division one light. Um, we can do some of the very same things that division one can do as far as scholarships are concerned. Uh, we just can't do it as often and we have less scholarships to work with, but uh, there's a wide variety of uh, school types in division two. There's some large schools with 15, 20,000 students and there's some very small private colleges in division two with maybe a thousand students or less. I think you would find that the academic criteria probably vary greatly depending on the institution. There are some really selective schools uh, in Division II, depending on uh, just what their overall academic requirements are. Uh, we are kind of middle of the road at the University of Nebraska Kearney um, and pretty much in line with the, the normal NCA requirements. Uh, there's a some score on the ACT or the SAT uh, it kind of fluctuates now. They have a sliding scale that uh, combines with your GPA. And between your GPA and uh, your test scores, you have to meet a certain criteria to become uh, uh, eligible for competition. And then obviously uh, you have to be admitted to our school. So uh, pretty straightforward there uh, as far as uh, what it takes to be eligible in Division Two. Uh, Justin? Yeah, within Division Three, uh, the academic requirements um, are based on per school. Uh, there is the eligibility department does uh, take over. You do have to have a uh, be in progress toward a a um, degree within the uh, university. Um, but each school has entry requirements. Uh, the difference in Division Three and uh, Division One and Division Two, or NAI and uh, NJCA is that in Division Three we can't label our scholarships uh, athletic. Um, it doesn't mean that we are not, we don't have scholarships. It's just none of our scholarships are labeled as athletic. They're all need-based or academic part. So for instance, in our school, we usually have um, a minimum ACT of 21 and a minimum uh, SAT, I believe two part of uh, about 1100. So we, we ask that uh, students that come in here, you know, GPAs range anywhere between 3.0 uh, to 4.0, you know, depending on, you know, some, some GPAs go to a seven point scale. So uh, GPAs are, are great to know kind of where you fit within your school, uh, but knowing those standardized tests helps us to know where you would fit within uh, our whole student body. Uh, but all of our scholarships are based on your academics. They are based on your financial need. Um, and none of them are based on specifically on how well you play volleyball. So Division Three is a little bit different. Uh, we used to be in an NAI school, which uh, we have some people from NAI, uh, but in the Division Three mindset, uh, we want you to make sure that you're coming for the schooling and uh, we reward you for your academic success, um, but we are also competitive as well. Can you hear me now? Ooh. Great. Sorry, I didn't even know. I just want to make sure. Yeah, you're good, Linda. Yes, you're good. Uh, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself real quick, um, and we can continue on. Awesome. Thank you. Sorry. Um, I apologize for the delay of technical difficulties. Um, I'm Linda Hampton Keith. I'm a former Division One head coach, uh, and I've been at the Division One level for about 19 years uh, at various levels. And um, uh, just happy to help and uh, give any kind of insight um, wherever I can help. So, uh, is it? Do you want me to go ahead and talk about academic stuff? I think I kind of heard everyone kind of give a brief overview of their division. That's like, oh, good. I can't hear you guys now. Okay. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. Yes, you can. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so Division One, I know I, I heard kind of everyone give their spiel. Um, 
basically uh, for division one, there's, it's kind of very similar to what everyone has already said. There's a huge wide variety uh, in division one in terms of level of play, in terms of academics, in terms of um, kind of accessibility, if you will. I think one of the common misconceptions about uh, division one um, is the level. Uh, like I've, I've mentioned several times on these that there's a lot of division twos that can kick some division one butt for sure. Uh, and so it's really about doing your research and really understanding um, what it is you're looking for in a school and, and in a program and how that fits for you. And another misconception is also too that the scholarship wise that it's that everyone's fully funded and that's not necessarily true. Uh, and so like in, in understanding what fully funded means, um, if a fully funded program usually has 12 full scholarships, and in volleyball, because of our sport, the way it's um, counted through the NCAA as a counter sport that once you do, if you do receive an athletic scholarship in volleyball, it's kind of an all or nothing deal. Uh, so you count as a full scholarship, whether you're either getting books or, or you're getting the whole, the whole thing. And so I think just that's, a, again, a, a common misconception is that everybody has all these scholarships all the time. And that's not, again, not true. Um, and so just that may be a question that you want to ask as you're going through the process, because there are Division II programs that are funded even better than a lot of Division I programs. Um, some Division I programs may only have um, eight to 10 scholarships. And when you have that situation, you can kind of break them up um, into pieces. Whereas usually, again, if you're a fully funded Division I program with 12 scholarships, that's typically an all or nothing deal. And so that's, again, one of those kind of questions you want to ask that you may not think to ask um, if a program is fully funded and uh, scholarship wise and how that kind of breaks down for that program as well so those are just kind of the kind of the, again the misconceptions um, for that Aaron? Sure, we are an NAIA program and probably what what's interesting and I get this question a lot we're kind of a hybrid between uh, the Division II, Division III world, we are able to offer scholarships. Uh, a fully funded program can offer eight scholarships. Um, what you're going to find within the NAIA world is uh, you can find that the scholarships are dispersed throughout uh, teams. So in, in more on more occasions than not, you're going to see more teams have maybe a total of four to six scholarships that they're able to split up among their team. Um, from an academic standard, uh, there are NAIA eligibility standards um, coming in. There's a test score requirement, a high school GPA requirement, um, and a class rank requirement. So an 18 on the ACT, a 970 on the SAT, a GPA of 2.0 or higher, and then graduating in the top half of your class. Uh, so those are requirements coming in in order to be eligible at the NAIA level. Um, we do have uh, less recruiting regulations from a coaching standpoint. So a lot of times you may see NAIA coaches talking to younger players. We don't necessarily have um, timelines and restrictions on phone calls and interacting with players in the same way you would see at uh, the division two three and or, and one level so those are pr probably the the biggest differences within the naia um but we are able to offer scholarships and most schools are able to stack scholarships uh, so they will stack academics with athletics and need-based scholarships um, and and try to come up with uh, the best case uh, financial um, situation possible. Um, as a, a school as a whole, you're going to see a lot of NAIA schools are smaller private institutions. Um, so ranging more from an enrollment standpoint, of maybe a thousand to to 2,500 students is is more in line with what you would see. Um, within an NAIA institution. You're also going to see NAIA institutions possibly being a satellite campus of a larger state school, um, and those are pub publicly funded institutions, but you're, you're going to find a mix of that within the NAIA. Paula? 
Yeah, um, I'll speak specifically towards NJCAA um, since that's what I'm most familiar with. Um, we are actually divided up into three different divisions, Division One, Division Two, and Division Three. Um, it's similar in the Division One setting where um, the, all three divisions have up to 14 scholarships that they can utilize or letter of intent to, to hold a player because Division Three is a non-scholarship, athletic scholarship, which is very similar to what it is at the NC2A level. Um, Division One can fully scholarship players. Um, they can offer tuition fees, room board books, actually transportation one time per academic year um, to and from home. Uh, Division Two is limited to tuition fees and books. And again, like I said, D3 is, is non-scholarship. So, um, you know, the, the types of schools, the, the uh, academic requirements kind of can be institutionally based. However, a lot of two-year schools are what are considered open enrollment. Um, you don't necessarily have to have an ACT or SAT score coming in. Um, typically, like with on our campus, even if they don't have a score coming in, they we we have ACT SAT testing that can um, they can go to a testing center and get it done at some point in time to help them moving forward, depending on some of the requirements um, moving on to a four-year school. So. Um, I think people choose a two-year school for a lot of different reasons. Again, there is a wide range of, of schools and programs from schools that have students that come in, they're still interested in, in athletics, they wanna be a part of a team, um, but they're not necessarily looking at maybe continuing on after that two-year run. Um, and then you have schools that are very well funded that, that kind of operate like a four-year school just in a two-year setting. Um, they are trying to prepare their athletes to move on into four-year programs. Um, so again, there's a wide range of, of the types of programs that you could be looking at. Um, we're unique in the sense that we are recruiting and then we're also trying to prepare our players moving on um, as they are being recruited. Um, we we kind of give them an op opportunity to play at a collegiate level prior to maybe moving into a four-year program. Um, typically as a freshman or sophomore. So, you know, there are some advantages in that setting. Um, there are, we, we do have very different types of schedules depending on where you're located and what type of institution you're playing for. Um, some, some schools, again, they travel all over the country, um, like you would see some of the other four-year schools and, and they play good competition throughout the season. Uh, others may be more regional based, depending on where they are and, and what their kind of region or institutional philosophy is. So, um, and it's, you can't judge the book by its cover because there are many different opportunities. Um, the size of schools, again, can be very drastic. Uh, we have schools that have anywhere from, let's say 1,500 to 2,000 students up to some of the largest educational, post-secondary educational institutions in the country. Uh, when you look at like Miami-Dade College, their student enrollment is is up in probably the top 10 of all universities within the United States. So, you know, again, it's a very wide range there. Awesome. Uh, so the next question, I will kick it off to uh, Justin. And if everyone wants to chime in, if they have additional information, feel free to do so. Uh, but Justin, the next question is, uh, what does the recruiting process look like and who is all involved in that process? In the, in Division Three, uh, specifically with where I am and where we are at Bellhaven, um, our recruiting process usually starts around your junior year. Um, as you'll hear some of the other coaches talk about, you know, uh, with the new rules that have come out, uh, you are able to talk to players uh, after their junior year, I believe June 1st or uh, June 15th, the Division One starts. Um, we're allowed to have your junior year, uh, January 1st, we're allowed to give you an official visit, which means we uh, pay for your visit to come visit us um, January 1st of your junior year. So for us, recruiting starts about there. Um, and recruiting just is basically an invitation to be a part of our family, to be a part of our culture, to be a part of our uh, group that we are. And, um, and uh, most likely it's it's done through a team of people um my assistant and i are the ones that go to comp, uh, competitions we'll go to club tournaments we'll go to high school tournaments and things like that um, but then you get handed off to we have uh, academic people we have our admissions staff 
and uh, we have our financial aid uh, advisors as well that are kind of the in-betweens and we all work together to find a place where it's affordable for you and competitive. We're not gonna have full scholarships uh, at my institution, um, but we have places where we wanna make sure that you are you have a financial piece about it, um, but also that we keep our lights on and you keep your lights on. So in the Division Three mindset and specifically at Bellhaven, we'll start recruiting around now for rising juniors. That'll be uh, the class of 2023. Um, in 2022, we're trying to finish up that 2022 class um, as we get into August and September. So that's kind of where we are in recruiting is we try to recruit juniors and have them signed by the uh, by about October 1st of their senior year. All right, Richard. Okay, we would, you know, in a normal circumstance, we would probably begin to narrow our scope uh, at the end of uh, the sophomore season. Uh, COVID has obviously set things behind a little bit for a lot of us, so uh, we're more into uh, kind of dealing with the junior class right now. But in a typical year, we would like to know a little bit about who we are planning to recruit toward the end of their sophomore year, uh, get serious about it during their junior season. Uh, most of the time, we begin to make some offers uh, during someone's junior season. We cannot contact them until June 15th prior to their junior year of high school is kind of the, uh, the target date that is set by Division II. And so um, offers could be extended, you know, in that time period and, and uh, carrying forward on through uh, their junior club season. Uh, we like to have the bulk of our recruiting wrapped up probably in the summer uh, going into a person's senior year of high school. Uh, we always talk to them about, uh, uh, if possible, having their decision made before they have to go play their senior year. In a lot of cases, I think they feel good about that because uh, it removes some stress going through their senior year of high school. Um, and uh, our signing date is in November. Uh, and uh, so usually we have verbal commitments that we've collected up through that period of time. And then uh, we will sign our class uh, in the November period uh, of their senior year. So that's kind of how it works in, in D2. Paula? Um, with two-year schools, I think it's come a wide variety. I, we, we look at a lot of juniors and seniors. Um, it, it, it's interesting because we, um, you know, we can track kids. And, and again, I think it kind of depends on what some of the student athletes are looking at going into the recruitment process. Um, there are some kids who, you know, they know that they want to stay local. Um, they're looking for opportunities in a very small region. Um, there are programs that recruit, uh, you know, nationwide, internationally. Um, they look at student athletes starting probably around their sophomore year and kind of track those kids. Um, but I would say the primary bulk of the recruiting is done during a, a student athlete's junior and into their senior year. Um, you know, a lot of these kids are, are good enough athletes to play at almost any level, um, you know, and as a two-year school, our philosophy is we're trying to go after athletes who, again, may have an opportunity to, to get on the court and compete as a freshman or sophomore. Um, you know, there are some kids that they're they're going to go to high-level programs at the D2, NAI, D1 levels and start as freshmen. We understand that, but there are those kids that may be on the bubble a little bit and they, they want to see what they can get done. They may have some recruiting opportunities that uh, or places that are looking at them. But a lot of times, depending on you know some of the two year programs that they may look at, it opens more doors for them if they are playing for that school for a year or two moving forward. Like I said, the uniqueness for us is that we are not only recruiting, but we're also trying to help our kids move on to four year programs. So. Um, you know, talking about that piece of it and, and helping them may have, 
maybe having more options after playing at a two-year school rather than what they may have coming straight out of high school. Um, those are things that you know we we try to work through and see if that that can help. You know, on the academic track side, there is very few instances where we have not. I've, I've been with Missouri State West Plains for 24 years uh, as an assistant head coach and we have not had issues with players coming in and you know going through just a general um, gen ed associates getting their you know gen ed block 48 hours moving forward unless they're getting in an extremely specialized program so you know the academic side of it there there have never been issues um, moving forward with trying to get players from the two-year level into a four-year program at any level because um, we've had players go to every every type of program that you can imagine moving from here. Aaron? So uh, at the NAIA level, we're also kind of referred to as the wild, wild west. <laughs> uh, we don't really have recruiting restrictions from a standpoint. We can talk to eighth graders if we want. We can invite them to campus, things like that. So. Um, we don't have a lot of recruiting restrictions from a contact point, um, reference point of when we can start the recruiting process. Our timeline is very similar um, to what you've heard from Rick and Justin of usually build those relationships uh, that sophomore year and then and start that, that signing commitment process during junior uh, year usually try to have things wrapped up headed into the senior season um, depending on the level of the program and the approach from specific coaches with the NAIA uh, it might be wrapped up by um, the end of that senior year season depending on resources and and that sort of thing but yeah very very similar um, in the recruiting aspect, the timelines, um, the, the biggest difference between us and the other entities is, is just the, the restrictions involved with contacting recruits, emailing recruits, phone calls, visits, um, and that sort of thing. Linda. Yeah. Um, Clearly, the uh, Division One has been impacted tremendously uh, by COVID and the rules and everything, because the rules um, changed, uh, I think, May of 2019, and then 10 months later, here we are. So I know that a lot of um, a lot of classes have been impacted by um, by COVID and the rules and and holding the, the good news and the light at the end of the tunnel is June 1st, which is right around the corner at this point. Um, things will open back up again, and, and go to quote unquote normal. And so I think that's obviously that's great news for everyone. Uh, I think it's been over a year, well over a year since uh, Division One coaches have been allowed to go off campus and recruit. And, um, again, Division Two and Division One follow a lot of the similar rules and timelines in terms of communication. Um, uh, but one thing I know Division Two has been able to go out and recruit some uh, and Division One has not. And so once, um, once June 1 hits and things will kind of, again, we're kind of return to normal, um, the, the typical timeline then becomes that June 15th, that same June 15th um, timeline um, after your sophomore year. And so, and then quickly followed up by um, August 1 before your junior year, uh, being able to take visits and things like that. And so, you know, I, I anticipate, I would assume that, you know, once June 1 um, opens up, Coaches are going to obviously go off campus now and, and visit, you know, whether it be uh, tournaments or practices, they'll be able to kind of, again, open that back up, followed by communications uh, being um, lifted on, you know, June 15th and then August 1 again. So hopefully things will kind of get back, uh, back on track, if you will, coming up this year, whereas last year this time we had no idea going into this what was what was to come and, and when things were going to open back up again. And so, um, so again, we Division One as far as contact follows a lot of the Division Two timelines. Um, and I think, you know, the biggest thing, and I, I assume, I hope, hopefully people have been proactive. That's been the, the biggest uh, message, I think, is just being as proactive as you can be, um, given the restraints that coaches can't communicate with you. 
um, and, and certainly can come see you. And, and now as things kind of pick back up, really, you know, one of my biggest messages was just really taking uh, taking a driver's, getting in the driver's seat of your own process and really working towards um, as much as you can, communicating, narrowing things down on your own that you kind of know where where you stand and, and kind of what you're looking for in a, in a program, whether that be academically, whether that be athletically, whether whether it's you know, the level of competition, whatever that may be that may be driving your decision to go to college and what you want to get out of that. Um, I think hopefully the you know last year has been able to help people really connect with the reason and their purpose for why they even want to continue playing volleyball in college, um, what it is they're looking for. Maybe you're driven by your major, maybe you're driven by the competition, maybe you're driven by location. So hopefully, hopefully this last year has been provided those opportunities for people to, again, just really connect and think about what it is that they want out of their experience so that when things do open up, um, I, I feel like the floodgates are going to open and they're going to open fast and things are going to move very quickly. Um, at least you have a little bit of control over your process and can direct it because when things stay open and wide for a long amount of time, I think that really creates a lot of confusion and uh, makes things a little bit harder. But if you can be focused um, when the time comes and the, the floodgates do open, then you can kind of manage and, and man maneuver yourself through that process a little bit easier because you're, you're going to be a little bit more focused on what it is you're looking for, what's good for you, what you think may be good so you can have those conversations with those coaches, um, what's completely off the table for you so you don't have to use any kind of mental resources and energy um, you know, exploring op options that you just don't think are going to be right for you. And so I think that's that was kind of, again, the, my message of the last year was just really using this time to focus in. And now that we're getting really, really close, just really kind of have a plan. Have a plan in place as best you can. Um, have a Be as focused as you can so that when the time comes, you can stay a little bit in the process as best you can. And, um, and really drive your process yourself, as opposed to always constantly waiting for to see what's going to happen next with what whatever coaches may be contacting you, whatever programs may be contacting you. Um, that's again to me the, the main thing is June one. It's coming. It's close, guys. Hang tight. <laughs> I know the co of, of all the coaches, which is why one of the reasons why I'm here is because um, because I'm not affiliated right now. And, you know, uh, affiliated coaches right now can't even, couldn't be a part of this uh, panel because of the rules that are in place. Um, but I, I've talked to a lot of my friends over the year, and they are just they they can hardly stand it. They're ready to go. They're ready to get back out there and and continue developing the relationships with with athletes and really trying to do their best to connect with recruits as well. So hang tight. June one's almost here. It'll it's gonna open up quick. Awesome. And that actually kind of is a gateway into the next question. So I'll kick it back to you, Linda. But what are some other uh, do's or don'ts that you can think of to share to potential recruits? I think um, so. This is a, this is a tough one. I think one of the toughest things to deal with because um, it's a do and a don't <laughs> like email. Right. Like I know when I was coach, I mean, emails were just Coaches are getting inundated with emails and email correspondence. And so I'm, I'm not saying don't do that, <laughs> but I am saying that when you do reach out, um, really, first and foremost, respect the coach's kind of time, if you will. Like, uh, you know, I'd make it really quick and short and to the point. And, and you know, I know we've talked about videos and the, uh, you know, efficiency of video. Obviously, coaches had to use video a lot during this last year. Um, to evaluate. And so if you're going to include a video, make it again short, sweet, and to the point. Um, get to the um, you know, get to the highlights. I coaches, of course, are going to also tell you they want to see everything, they want to see your mistakes, and that's all true. Uh, but I think the initial punch is just to again differentiate yourself or show why you add value and how you're going to add value to that program, whatever that may be, whether it be you can jump real high and hit real hard. Great. There's lots of places looking for that. So great. Show that. But if it's something specific that you really want to highlight, whether it's your amazing GPA and 
you know, you know that you can, um, you know, add to, you know, you, this school has your major and you really want to be there. So there's lots of ways to kind of grab someone's attention quickly in a way that's going to be, um, that's going to just differentiate you. Because again, I, I can't even imagine the amount of emails coaches have gotten. It was bad when I was coaching. I can't even imagine now. It's probably uh, doubled. Um, but so just really creating um, a way to still have that correspondence, but also set yourself apart a little bit as best you can. And also having, um, you know, again, a plan in place, like showing that you're you're going to be consistent with that communication too. I think that's one of, you know, everyone can email once, but also just kind of trying your best to create a relationship as best you can. And then, so that when, again, that time comes, you can kind of pick back up and, and go forward with that. So good videos, you know, again, quick as, as quick as you can, as quick as you point, because the coach will always ask you for more video. You know, the coach will always, you know, can say, hey, I want to see this, I want to see that. And so, um, so you don't want to necessarily right out of the gate, give a huge long video that's hours long, um, but you do want to have that video available if they come back and ask and say, hey, I really, I like this, I want to see some more, whatever the case may be. So, um, so yeah, just, and be patient, <laughs> be patient. You may not get replies or you may not know, you know, depending on if they can even con connect with you at that point, depending on what grade you're in. So, and being patient with them as well. So. Those are some tidbits for you. Does anyone else want to chime in on that? I'll say a couple things just because, like I said, we're in a unique situation where I have players that are looking for advice and trying to, um, you know, get noticed. And Linda kind of hit the nail on the head whenever you talk about sending something that is going to catch someone's attention. I mean, recruiting myself and like you say, the number of emails that we look through, uh, video is important. Um, you can introduce yourself all day, but until they kind of see what you look like on video, it, it only goes so far. Um, so, you know, catching their attention, if, if they like what they see and it doesn't take much time, they're going to reach out and try to find out more about you. And so, you know, putting something together that is that is going to in the kind of the athletic academic package is something that we talk about with our players because you need to make yourself more valuable. Um, you know, I, I kind of talked to that same thing whenever I talked to high school kids. I said, you know, what what the position you put yourself in moving forward, um, you do have more value if your athletic and academic package is solid. Um, so that academic piece is extremely important, um, you know, coming from a two-year school going into a four-year program, because it, it can mean a lot when it comes down to the financial position that you put yourself in, um, depending on the division or where you end up transferring to. So, um, yeah, it is. It, it's, it's a matter of getting something um, out to the coaches, following up when they are asking for information, follow up follow up, follow up, you know, don't, don't drop off the face of the earth and like, I'll get back to it whenever you feel like you have time. If, if you're truly interested in your path moving forward, you have to show that interest in, in keeping up with the questions that are being asked of you. So um, those are probably the two things that I hear from other coaches when they're contacting our players and the pros and the cons of that. You know, some are really good about following up and, and some, it, it seems like they're trying to find them half the time, so. I, I could also piggyback off of what Linda and Paula have shared so far, um, is try to be as dynamic um, and personal in those emails as possible, specifically to those coaches and schools that you're super interested in. Um, do your research. Take the time. We get a we get so many emails that are from recruiting agencies, and we can see those from a mile away when it's just a generic email or they've spelled the coach's name wrong or something uh, where where we can tell that they have not reached out personally to us. But if it's a school, and that's good, that's a good aspect of like using some of those recruiting sites and things like that to get get your name out and get exposure from a mass level. Um, and, and get a quantity of coaches looking at you. But if you're really interested in specific schools, it's very important to try to connect with those coaches on a personal level. 
give those highlight films, make sure the highlight films are dynamic in a sense of they capture the coach's attention really quickly. Um, if I open a highlight film for a six foot middle hitter or a six foot outside and the first skill I see is serving, I'm gonna move on pretty quickly. So it, you wanna make sure that your skills um, are being shown specific to uh, your position. You wanna capture the coach's attention right away and you are more likely to catch a coach's attention when they open up an email that has some type of personal connection. You, you had a great season. I see that you're, you have this as a specific part of your culture, things like that. If you're doing your research, you're connecting with the university, you're not connecting with the coaches, uh, you, can, you can build a personal relationship pretty quickly and, and get better looks from specific coaches. Okay, I'll jump in here and add a couple things onto that. Um, you know, basically we, we get a million emails, keep them short and sweet. I've been on both sides of the equation. I've had some daughters who have gone on and played college volleyball. So I've been on the sending of the email side too. A short email with your video link, a short video, uh, you know, it's already been mentioned uh, on point that we wanna see the things that translate to what we need. Uh, I don't like to see people tipping. Uh, if they're a hitter, I don't care how good a tipper you are. I don't care where it goes. I don't care how many tip kills you got. I don't want to see those. Uh, I don't want to see pancakes. I don't want to see uh, easy plays made to look hard. I want to see a player that um, makes the game look natural, makes the game look easy, makes routine plays look easy. So uh, ultimately, don't try to fool us. I can't tell you uh, the different types of videos and tricks and you know, all the technology now uh, where we've seen people that look absolutely fantastic on their highlight video, and then we go to watch them in person, and it is nothing like what their highlight video. So eventually, we're going to see the real you. So we want to see the real you on video. And so short and sweet, show us the real you, the things that to translate to our level. Uh, and then I would just throw in there, uh, Pick out a couple of volleyball camps at the schools you're interested in. If you're really interested in a school, get on their campus in the summer, go to a camp where they can see you for an extended period of time. And uh, that's uh, definitely one of the tools that we use once we've already maybe established a relationship is uh, we target some individuals to get them on campus for summer camp. Uh, and then, then they can seal the deal uh, while they're there for camp. And in Division Two, we can also have tryouts, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, we can bring people on campus, work them out with our players. And uh, I would add that uh, if you're coming in for a tryout, be prepared. Spend some time in the gym. Don't let that tryout be the first time you've touched the ball in the last two weeks because uh, you're not going to help yourself much that way. So uh, a lot of good things so far. That's my two cents. The last thing I would add is everybody's been saying be proactive. The two things that I would say is first off, uh, don't assume that your talent's going to bring people to your court. Um, if you've ever been to a national qualifier, um, there's a lot of courts. Uh, coaches aren't just looking around and saying, oh, I, I like that. I like that girl. I like that girl. I like that girl. There's You have to be proactive and uh, don't assume that somebody's just going to find you. Uh, you have got to be proactive as you do it. And then the last thing, um, kind of piggybacking off is uh, let us see your real self, but take a look at your social media. Um, I, I want to know who you are, um, but if you go on your social media and you have all these different things, or if you're talking poorly about your coaches or anything like that, um, please make sure you do a, a good check of your social media um, as a recruit. Uh, that's one of the big things that that, uh, that people don't necessarily understand is that we as coaches want to get to know you. We're making a commitment for four years to you or for two years to you, or for a year to you. Um, but our focus is on uh, who this person is that we're recruiting, not just necessarily their volleyball talent, but who they are as a person. So make sure that you take a look at your social media. Um, I wouldn't say clean it up. I just say clean up your life. Um, but that's just me. Um, don't fake it on there. Uh, I'd like to know who you are, but make sure that you do check, check out your social media. Maybe have somebody else check it out for you as well uh, from the outside. Yeah, I would like to add a couple of things too, just as listening to all these um, great points that people are making to, and that were, you know, I think 
and I'm saying this given the year that we just had, um, you know, I, I'm sure there has been some instances where scholarship offers have had to have been made just based off video, just because of the circumstances. But given that we're, things are, are about to open up and things are gonna, again, quote unquote, return to normal, um, I do think that, you know, what you're trying, what you're trying to accomplish is again creating the relationship right and you know very rarely um before covid surely I, the only times i've really heard of or even personally myself made any kind of scholarship offers were uh, to, you know i never made them just based off video alone um, the only exception to that was maybe if we were um recruiting someone overseas and we just couldn't get over there or whatever the case may be but you know here you know it recruiting wise we're not making offers based on your video so don't i guess panic about that um what you're again trying to do is show value and how you can connect and and bring value to whatever program that you're looking at and so i just a kind of a reminder is not like panic into panic yourself into the video into that process just look at it as building as a, a relationship and trying to find um, find your fit as the schools are going to do as well as finding the place where you are most comfortable and can thrive the environment that you can thrive in um, and so you know it's like again I hear of all these great things I, I just don't want people to get caught up in like oh I have, you know this video has got to be amazing and I got to do this You're like just be you like everyone else is saying and and there, we can always ask for more um, we're always going to you know, want to continue forward if, if there's some value there, if, if coaches can perceive some value there. So just want to throw that out there. Video scholarship offers aren't coming just based off video alone, especially now, hopefully going, because I know I know that's coaches are ready to go see people in person, because that's where they're really going to see how you handle your, how you handle mistakes, how, how good of a teammate are you, things that you really just can't pick up on video. Um, they're going to talk to your coaches and they're probably already doing that. So those are the things that, again, just don't put so much emphasis on a video that you think this is your make or break. This is just a piece of the puzzle, of the recruiting puzzle, and really the, the work needs to be done on developing the relationships and finding your place that you're going to thrive as an athlete and as a student at the next level, wherever that may be. And, and coaches want to talk, they want the players to talk to them when they're in the recruiting process. Um, you know, I've been in situations where players come with parents on a visit and we love having parents because we want, we want them to understand what it is we do and kind of what their daughter may be getting themselves into. Um, we want to be very honest about that. But again, it's the players that we're trying to recruit. That's who we need to connect with. It, the, the parents just, you know, well, if we have questions for you, we will definitely ask. If you have questions for us, that's one thing, but don't answer for your kids. Um, that I've been in that situation way too many times. It would surprise you, and it is, it, it's kind of painful at times because you you just feel like you're not getting a chance to really see what what it is that the that the player is wanting um, or what they're looking for, and and that is something that as coaches, we, we want to know. We, we want to know what their commitment, what they're looking for, what their interest level is, not only as an athlete, but academically and everything else. So, Awesome. Okay. This next question, uh, I'll kick it off to Aaron. Uh, it's pretty specific. So, um, so it's going to be based on everyone's um, own experience, but uh, what does a typical day or week look like for a player during the season? Sure. During season, um, a, a typical day would be class in the morning, um, usually wrap classes up by 3, 3 p.m. Um, so afternoon, the girls would report to the gym um, and we would usually begin practice um around four o'clock practice from four to six and then the girls would would eat dinner and and then proceed to go back to study depending on what year they are um, freshmen incoming freshmen during that fall season have required study hours um, so they would go to the library and get checked in and, and do their study hours during season from a weekly basis um, so 
we would practice uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursdays. We would compete Wednesday, Friday, Saturday. And that's just based upon our conference schedule. Um, depending on some conferences, you may see a Tuesday, Saturday match or a Wednesday, Saturday match. Uh, or you can see potentially three matches or one weeknight match and then a tournament on the weekend. So um, usually running, uh, six days a week uh, between practice and in competition and matches. Um, for our particular school, we have Sundays off. We never practice on Sundays. Most teams in our conference don't practice on Sunday. You may see some of that, but usually try to uh, leave that as a day off, rest, recoup, refresh, and, and kind of eat, sleep, and repeat for the following week. But a lot of time spent in the gym, a lot of time spent in the classroom. Um, and, and and we'll work in film sessions and things within that. Uh, but for most evenings during practice weeks, you're going to see uh, two to three hours between prep, training room, gym time um, on a normal on a normal day. Justin? It, very similar. Uh, most of the time on your Monday, Wednesday, Friday, we would have uh, 8 to 12 would be a class. Um, a lot of times on uh, during the middle of our weeks from Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, sometimes even on Monday as well, we have labs uh, from 1 to 4. A lot of our science majors have uh, labs they have to go to, which are about 2 to 3 hours long. Um, we also include weight training uh, during season. We have uh, two times a week during the season, three times a week during the off season. Uh, so from 7 to 7.50 or 7 to 8, depending on somebody has an 8 o'clock class on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, we have weight training. Um, and then at our school, we have a chapel. Uh, so on Tuesdays, uh, everybody goes to chapel. We go as a team and sit in the front row with our, with our team. Uh, but our other athletic teams, uh, there is no requirement to go as a team, but our, our school does require it. You have to scan your ID, scan in and out um, for our chapels. Um, a lot of Division three schools are private institutions. Uh, some are public institutions, but a lot do have a, a religious aspect to it. Um, we have practice normally from four to six uh, every single day that we don't play. We play Tuesdays, Fridays, Saturdays. Uh, we don't uh, do anything on, on a Sunday. Um, we do have a required study hall on Monday nights from seven to nine. Um, but again, most most of the time that kind of gives you an idea you know monday wednesday friday you got classes from eight to twelve if you're a science major you pretty much have two or three labs a week uh from one to four practices four to six uh, monday nights study hall um tuesday night we play um and then friday and saturdays we're either on the road or at home uh playing during those days but we also add in the, that uh, weight training time in the mornings uh for an hour for two hours a week an hour each morning on tuesday and thursday and then also we have chapel. Paula? Um, you know, honestly, it's very similar. I think each school kind of has th their method to the madness when it comes down to it. Um, you know, most of our classes are set up in the morning from eight to about two. Um, and then we have practice in the afternoon. We have a Monday through Thursday uh, evening study hall that's required unless you have a certain GPA. Um, you know, first time freshman, first semester, they're they're there every, because they're the travel schedule and everything else that we have going on through the the course of that first semester is is pretty rigorous. Um, you know, a lot of our schedule at our place because we don't have a large region or conference is built on tournament scheduling. Um, that way we can travel and get tournaments in, um, get more games in that way. So with that being said, we, we have a pretty extensive travel schedule that we kind of have to work around. We do schedule study halls and, and academic time on the road. Um, we've actually been lucky enough that we have a, a academic coordinator that works with our student athletes on our campus from the, in the evenings from that seven to nine, Monday through Thursday. Um, we have student tutors depending on the situation we've had a few times when we've been gone for an extended road stretch that we've had a 
a student tutor actually travel with us, which is a little bit unique sometimes um, because you know the academic piece is such a big part of what we want to make sure they stay on track. Um, you know, the training aspect, again, we, we have conditioning and lifting that we do, and we may have to schedule in the mornings, depending on the class schedules from semester to semester. Um, but we want to make sure that we are getting those pieces done um, where it's not just such, the physical part can't just be back to back to back uh, whenever it comes to practice and then trying to get some of the conditioning pieces in as well. So, you know, splitting those up, we get, typically we get more efficiency, um, get more done, and that way they can come in for shorter stretches, get things done, and then move on. So um, again, you know, talking about a six day a week kind of schedule is pretty much that Monday through Saturday is the way we look at it. Every once in a while, we may have a, a Saturday off, not playing in a tournament somewhere. So very similar. Thank you. Yeah, mostly what everybody's talked about, afternoon practice, uh, lift a couple times a week. And um, we typically play, most weeks we have a midweek game and then we play Friday, Saturdays, uh, league games. And uh, probably about the only thing I would add is that one thing we've tried to go out of our way to do the last several years is find some weeks where we can take two days off. Uh, I think players have played so much now by the time they get to college. Uh, you have overuse injuries and uh, things like that can occur. So if we can find some weeks during the season where we can take an additional day off, uh, we think that's important. Or at the very least, uh, we kind of examine the playing time of the roster. And if we have people who just came off of a weekend grind and they took, you know, 120 swings, uh, we'll sit them out on Monday. We'll, we'll be specific to the athlete enough where uh, maybe the starters don't get a lot of reps on Monday, uh, but some of the backups do. So we, we try to uh, incorporate uh, purposeful rest, uh, I think is what I would call it, because uh, toward the end of the season, people can be pretty beat up. Linda? Yeah, um, again, everyone's kind of hitting the same points, and I kind of always uh, explained kind of the time commitment. Um, and, and again, in, in Division One, it varies greatly. Um, but they, you know, essentially the cycle, as I call it, like there's a cycle that kind of happens, and, and we always, even though freshmen and we have our season in the fall, we always kind of look at the cycle as starting in January, you have your spring training, you have some rules that are going to regulate how much time you can spend um, in the spring, uh, typically start off at around eight hours a week um, in January, February, you hit about mid-March and you go into kind of a, we call it uh, kind of a segmented season, if you will, it's a spring season where you kind of mimic your fall, um, which is you go back to 20 um, for an amount of time. You also have some outside competition that you can engage in, um, you know, don't get a lot of press on those or spring competitions, very similar to like a club tournament where a bunch of schools will come together, play, um, and you'll, you can do four opportunities of that and then you kind of shut it down for spring. And again, depending on the institution and the program that you're, what the expectation is for summer school. So uh, there's some division one programs that don't provide summer school. So there may be some different expectations over summer. Uh, a majority of the higher level programs are going to have an expectation that you are in summer school, at least for a majority of the summer, if not all summer. So again, those are questions you gotta ask during the process. Uh, certainly at towards the end of summer, the, you know, most schools will have like a summer one, summer two, you just gotta ask those questions. Um, the usual expectation is that you would be in a summer school late in the summer, leading into season into August. And then obviously the fall is the fall. It's a competitive season. You've got your 20 hours a week. Um, I think, the, again, the biggest variation is the expectation of the time commitment. I mean, everyone has their 20 hours, but also understand that 20 hours is actually long court or workout time. So whether that's 20 hours includes your obviously your workout your weight training and conditioning 
Um, it could include any kind of like sports psychology meeting or anything, um, and then obviously your court time with the coaches. The biggest, again, variety, I, I think, and uh, one of the misconceptions is like, oh, 20 hours a week. Well, depending on your program, yes, that's 20 hours, but the expectation is, is that, you know, that doesn't include the time that you're in the training room, taking care of your body with your trainer and maybe rehabbing or doing preventative measures to take care of that. It's not counting, um, you know, obviously the academic time that you're putting in because most places are going to have a study hall component as well. So again, these are questions you've just got to ask as you go through the process of what those expectations are. And I think the biggest, um, again, differentiation is there becomes another segment um, if you are in a Power 5 league, um, they passed a few years ago, uh, some new rules that only affect the Power 5 conferences. And um, so, again, just something to be aware of where there are some additional days off. There's something called RARA now, RARA CARA days, which is countable athletic related. So that's the 20 hours a week. Anything that's countably athletic, athletically related is the time that you're spending in practice. Um, the competition actually counts as time towards that uh, and also anything that with the weight room um, anything that's conditioning anything that was required you to be there as a team there's also rare time now which is anything that's required athletics so that could be i mean it could be anything it could be um, a marketing promotion that your team has to show up for it could be a photo shoot for your team poster like so there's a lot more in-depth things once you get to the Power 5 level and a lot more um, protections, I think, for the student athlete to get some time off. There's also 14 additional days off at that level uh, that's spread out over the year. So again, it's just something to be aware of um, because I think in those programs, the expectation is that you're going to voluntarily be proactive in this process and you're going to want to uh, be the best for athlete that you can be and that and that we recognize that that requires a lot of time um, and so it's a protective measure I think for the student athletes to be in place to make sure that it doesn't go too much um, there are times where it used to be where if you traveled you know coming back from a competition that if you were you know you played on a Friday night um, at seven you got up and you traveled home on Saturday that that didn't that counted as a day off well a couple of years ago that changed and now that day does not count as a day that even just traveling back now counts as a, a, a athletic related activity that has to be accounted for as well so again these are just little nuances that uh, um, differentiate the power five from the rest of division one but overall uh, there are there are a lot of mid-majors that don't have to follow those rules but still have the same expectation as those programs in terms of their time commitment their um, just overall like commitment to them the, the mental and emotional commitment that it takes to be a part of the, those programs uh, and so again those are things that you've got to explore in the process of um where what are what what's the expectation what do you expect out of me time wise what do you expect out of me um kind of emotionally and 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 because it's fatiguing it you know you go through a whole year and it it's it is fatiguing but also worth it right if you're invested and it's and it's a great fit and you're in an environment that you're thriving in, it's all super worth it. Um, but at the same time, if you're not in a great environment and it's ta it can be taxing. So it really just depends on where you are, what, what level of commitment you're willing to make. Because I think that's the biggest, um, I guess, misstep is when there is a miscommunication about what the expectations are and coming in and that's when things kind of fall apart for people is when, when the expectations are missing each other. So you didn't think it was gonna take this much time? Well, it does, you know, that kind of thing. So just, I would be very, very, as you're eager to play volleyball at the next level, wherever that may be and whatever level that may be, it's really important to understand fully the expectation going into it so that there are no surprises and there are no um, just miscommunications and misunderstandings about what it takes to be great at that program and that's going to be different at every single program because every single program is different so it's just about finding that place it's about finding the place where you can thrive and that your expectations and their expectations can meet and create a wonderful match in volleyball heaven so
Awesome. Uh, this has been a lot of great information, and I think we're about to wrap things up. So um, before we do, uh, does anyone have any last pieces uh, they would like to share uh, with our audience right now before we uh, conclude this panel? I'll go. I just think that, again, we're coming off a really tough year, obviously, for everyone. You've all had to endure um, a lot. You've probably learned a lot about yourselves, and you've learned a lot about who you are and, and what, what it is you want and what you're looking for. And so I think just being confident moving forward into your process, whatever that may be, and, and moving confidently in a direction that, that you can be empowered and take kind of control of your narrative, take control of your process and communication so that again this is about you know it's about finding a great place it's about finding the right people to surround yourself with and to do so in a way that that is coming from a place of empowerment on on the recruits part and uh, so I'm just very encouraging as, as we as we get through this tough year and we start moving towards um, you know, think getting back to normal that we all we all do so from a place of empowerment and and just excitement to get moving again and 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 just finding the best place for you wherever that may be. So I'm just encouraging and and hoping uh, the best for everyone and and good luck with your recruiting process. All right. Well, that is all the time that we have. Once again, I would like to thank all of my panelists for taking the time to participate today. It was greatly appreciated. And I want to thank again the Great Plains Region for helping the ABCA provide a panel such as this and also providing a professional network for everyone to enhance the sport of volleyball. But thank you everyone for being able to attend and we hope you have a wonderful evening.